Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to episode 86 of Bruce Less Travel, the podcast exploring the best uncharted craft beer scenes across the U.S. I'm your host, Brian. Happy again to be joined by my co-host for this month, MC. MC, how's it going? What's up, Brian? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I am doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, as I as I mentioned to you earlier, I have uh, I have uh, I've been working in a, a, a new brewery as my new job, and I've used uh, uh, dangerous chemicals this week for the first time, and and managed to not hurt myself with said dangerous chemicals. So well done, well done. Keep it up. But uh, I hear there's controversy. Mm, Con- so much controversy. controversy out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Indeed. Yeah. I think it's interesting. We're here this month. Um, uh, yeah. Controversy around, I'm sure everybody's heard, but I'm interested to hear your take on it, Brian. Um, controversy around fat tire, new Belgium fat tire did, um, quite a rebranding. Um, I have heard a little bit about mostly heard heated opinions about it. Um, but I'd be interested to hear your take. Uh, it, they they reformulated their recipe and all of the marketing around it. So um, yeah, what's your take on that? What are you thinking about it? Do you so, um, do you like when breweries do that? Do you feel opposed to it? Yeah. So uh, New Belgium, um, a brewery that I've uh, I've watched for many years, and that I I am a big was a big fan of when they were employee owned and they were like the model of what you could build as a brewery for many reasons. And Fat Tire was their flagship. It was a beer that built them up to who they became in many ways. In recent years, they uh, unfortunately went the way of, of many breweries and, and decided to sell the ownership of the company to an outside entity, an international brewing company that I can't, quite here right, right. right. here in the yep. japanese company yep. and um with those sales decisions get made that come down from the top and things get changed and oftentimes they're little things like payroll employee relations uh I- internal operating procedures and sometimes they're huge overhauls of beloved brands and uh the good of it I think the new label looks phenomenal. I think the I do too. Of I think it, it's great. It's it's a throwback to the classic, as they said in the in the marketing, and um, it's just a great eye catching branding, and it looks great. Messing with the recipe, I I don't like that. I just yeah. keep fat tire what it is, and maybe roll out another brand alongside of it that fat tire light, or you know, I I don't know. I, I don't, I don't work in that side of the brewery. You know, I work in guest experience mostly. Um, that's where my background is. And I, uh, I don't know ultimately why those decisions are, are made, but I feel like don't, don't, don't change the, the major, the major brands. I felt the same way when Stone redid right. all of their flagship IPAs. They did, they redid IPA, they redid, uh, ruination they redid their pale ale so yeah they but it's their own company you know they can right. do whatever they want yeah i mean it it is really funny that people are so up in arms about it because like kind of the opinions that i've heard about it and and share um is that one i mean it's fat tire is a fantastic beer um but you don't really know that unless I mean, people don't buy it. And that's what the whole problem was, right? That like numbers were way, way down. And so they rebranded so that they could sell it. Um, And so, you know, if people were so emotionally attached to this beer, then they should have supported it before now. You know, I do think it's a huge bummer. A big part of the recipe change was that it's going to be um, basically a golden ale now. So it's going to be yeah. lighter in color. Um, and I think a little more hop forward and yeah, in my opinion, if you want a golden ale, you know, order one. Um, and it's, it's a shame to see, you know, there's not very many classic examples of 
am, you know, American amber ales out there. And we've, you know, lost the, the, the best example that there was in my opinion, you know, and I'm guilty of that. I hadn't had a fat tire in years. And when I was studying for Cicerone, you know, that's obviously the amber ale that I picked up and I was like, why don't I drink this? This is incredible. Um, you know, I kind of always made fun of it as kind of like a 40 year old man beer. Um, and maybe I'm just, maybe that's just where my tastes are leaning. Um, but yeah, in my opinion, like everybody has their own taste in beer. And if a fat tire isn't what you want, then don't order it. And so it seems counterintuitive to change the recipe, but yeah, like you said, it's their brand. And, um, you know, if, if we wanted fat tired to stick around the way that it was classically, then, you know, we should have stepped up and supported it. So, so the controversy, right. Yeah. The controversy is kind of what gets me. I saw a really funny tweet that was like, I'm really mad about this beer recipe change that I haven't bought since 2011. And I thought that just like hit the nail on the head. It was like, exactly. You know? Um, So yeah, all that to say, I think I don't really have like a strong opinion on it. I'm interested to try the new one and I'll miss the old one, even though again, it wasn't a beer that I typically drink. Yeah. Yeah. Say a Yeah. Oh, you know. in the chat, um, it's being compared to the new Coke disaster of uh, <laughs> of the the late eighties. Yeah, yeah. Well, now breweries out there are just gonna have to make their own fat tire and and put it on. And I hope they do. I hope we well, see some like revamping. See how well that amber ale sells, and then yeah. maybe we'll all better like you mentioned better better relate to why new belgium would make that choice but i don't think we're getting off the hop train anytime soon so i don't nope i don't anticipate those amber ales doing super well so i kind of see why they did what they did yep maybe one day yep but for now we are back with another episode uh focusing on northern colorado and the breweries in and around the fort collins area Uh, Today, we're featuring Crooked Stave Artisan Beer Project, and we'll be enjoying their New uh, New, New England. Oh, man. I got hops on the brain. Uh, (laughs) New Zealand Pilsner, as well as their Excelsior Chai Sour Ale. Very excited for both of these beers. Yeah, um, they are both really, I'm looking forward to both of them. Um, And not only are we going to have a couple of great beers, we're going to be joined by a really great guest from Crooked Stave. Um, So please join us, everybody, in welcoming the Director of Sales and Marketing, Kaylee Armitage. Hi, everyone. Hey, Kaylee. Kaylee. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Let's kick things off uh, with our quick sip questions. Uh, These are fast questions. We want fast answers, and they'll help us get to know you fast. Make sense? Perfect. Yeah, I'm in. Cool. Great. Uh, So, favorite non-crooked stave beer? (laughs) That's so tough. Um, Pretty much, oh, I have to, uh, I know quick answers, right? Damn. Um, right now I have been really enjoying Boneyard beer. Um, we are going to do a collab with them and I'm really into it. Woo! Yeah. Featured in our, our wonderful bend episodes of this very podcast. Shout out the Boneyard. They roll. Um, a favorite peak in the Rockies. Ooh, favorite is peak in the Rockies is going to be quandary. Different answers than our guest. Different answer than our guests last week. Uh, speaking of the mountains, ski or snowboard? Ski. All righty. Uh, we mentioned New Belgium earlier. We talked about their fat tire, but uh, as somebody that works at a sour brewery, Le Terroir or La Folie? La Folie. Okay. Um, and then our fa- our our final and favoritest quick sip question. Kaylee, have you ever seen a UFO, a ghost, Bigfoot? inexplicable event anything like that 
Mm, I'd like to think I saw Bigfoot, but it could have just been a hunter. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, in Colorado, it's like we all see it, right? You go out, you see the stars, you see something, but uh, tough to nail down what it actually was. All right. All right. Well, let's get into this first spear. I know that I have been really looking forward to it. Um, we're going to open this New Zealand Pilsner. What would you like to tell us about this? Tell us a little bit about this beer. Awesome. Um, first and foremost, I think the biggest thing about the beers that we have showcasing tonight is really like the true range of what Crooked Steve has to offer. Um, New Zealand Pilsner in general has been one of our highest sellers year over year. Uh, definitely a fan favorite within our brewers. It's light, crisp, a little bit floral, hints of citrus, and a little bit of a light spice. Um, a lot of that comes from the New Zealand hops. So uh, just a little side note about it. Um, nothing in our brewery is filtered, so it is still an unfiltered Pilsner. Um, true five to six week. Yeah, nice, clean Pilsner. Um, I will say our favorite part about this is that a lot of the people in our brewery, our favorite hops come from New Zealand. Um, so we had our traditional Von Pilsner, which is our Keller Pils, and we made the first New Zealand Pilsner as like a one-off in a 16 ounce can. Then we started making it as just like a seasonal release. And it has by far, I mean, the Pilsner lager craze has gone off the charts last year into 2023. But this is definitely like our fan favorite. So when we got to pick a beer to go in, it's like, well, what is every brewer and every employee pick? New Zealand Pils. I'm, totally. I'm here for this lager Pilsner craze. Yeah, Did me too. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely nice and uh, nice and floral. Um, get a little citrus rind in there. I like that a lot. I read that this beer... Um, the hops were hand selected by your team. So where were they selected? Were they selected in the U S or did a group of folks go to the New Zealand or how did that work? Yeah. So our team went down to New Zealand. Um, we selected them in Matueka, um, during hop harvest. We continue to do that year after year. Obviously, there was a little bit of a side note there in 2020, 2021, where yeah. there was a huge population down. Um, fun fact, these hops that we use in this beer was grown right outside of where I lived in New Zealand for a few years and Chad studied abroad. Um, so we definitely go down, we handpick hops. Um, we pick the hops that goes in into each of the brews. And yeah, it's kind of like a little taste of home or our second home, some would say. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, this really is really special. I think as somebody has mentioned in the chat, they opened it along with us and they're almost through it. Um, they, these, these go down very easy. It, it is, it is a wonderful crushable beer with a, a lot of, a lot of depth in its character for, you know, what many would consider to be a, a simple style in a, in a Pilsner, but. I uh, agree. Yeah. Pilsners are definitely slightly on the simpler end this is kind of like our take on a pilsner so like just slightly different rendition obviously going to be a little bit hot forward we do hear that from people like pilsners aren't supposed to be happy um but i think it's a nice balance between the two it's also definitely the one that all of us crush on a non-stop basis <laughs> uh i can definitely see why so uh Kayla, can you tell us about your background and how you got started with cricket stave yeah. Um, so I started with Crooked Save in 2016. We actually just celebrated our 12 year anniversary a couple weeks ago, which is exciting. Um, yeah, started in 2010 with Chad. Um, I came on to the team in 2016. Really what you'll notice when I came on sales and marketing to start with. Um, but I think everyone in our company wears a lot of different hats. So, you know, operations bound, all of us have to learn how to brew, seller, um, package. So definitely like an in-depth education process within the company, something that I'd never seen before. I had come from other Colorado breweries prior and 
Crooked Save definitely upped the ante in regards to what um, each of us do. So I help manage a lot of our distribution sales and then all of our marketing efforts, including branding and new product development. And then um, day-to-day operations from packaging calendars, along with a lot of our seller program, what gets packed with our production manager, um, tasting through and a lot of the barrel age program as well. Wow. You're a busy woman. Yeah. <laughs> so um, everybody, everybody learns how I'm, I'm just fascinated by the, the training process. Everybody learns how to brew. Everybody learns how to package. Everybody learns cellaring work. Yeah. So we, um, we go through quite the process. We've cut it down over the years. Prior, um, when I started in 2016, it was a three-day brew process, a three-day seller process, a three-day package process, and then you spent like almost a week in the one that you liked the most. Um, So you definitely learn the ins and outs. I think a lot of us wore a lot of hats where we did a little bit of everything, Um, It gave us all a really strong sense of appreciation for what other people did in our brewery. Um, We also had to work days in tap room. Our tap room employees had to work days on packaging, cellar, brewing. So um, yeah, there wasn't really a lot back in the day that none of us did. Now we have a little bit of of a quicker process for some new hires in regards to that, but our sales team definitely goes through the entire process always. So it's, it's definitely a unique process and it, um, it's very education based. So you are meant to come every day with lots of questions. And by the end, hands on, you're doing everything by uh, kind of being overseen by someone else. So. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. I, I see that a lot in breweries where, you know, the bartenders just have no idea what's going on in the back or the brewers have no appreciation for, you know, the hard work that it takes to run the tap room. And, um, I think a lot of breweries could benefit from, you know, a training system like that. That's, that's so cool. Um, before coming to Crooked Save, I definitely thought I knew a lot about beer. I'd worked in beer for several years, craft beer specifically. I was like, I got this. And then I started working at Crooked State. There's so much to learn. There's so much science behind it. There's so many processes. And to be honest, without having that structure and that system, I would have never gotten to where I am now in this industry. So, yeah. Um, what are your favorite things about working for such a unique brewery like Crooked Stave? Um, top things I love about working for Crooked Stave, definitely like cre- creativity, innovation, and passion. I feel like those three things kind of like triumph through everything that we do. I love that we are such a close-knit team, but with that being said, everyone has a say in creativity, innovation, and passion. Um, so it doesn't matter like what you do at Crooked Stave, you definitely have a say in those items. I think another thing I love about working for them is just our strive for quality and education. Um I've never witnessed or worked for a brewery that really focuses on that through and through. Uh, We have like beer education courses that we put out almost monthly in our tap rooms. Um, Chad puts out sensory programs for our staff almost monthly. Um, We are really striving to have the best quality, the best education. Anyone can join our sensory teams throughout the brewery and there are no ideas that do not go at least semi through the gamut of our product innovation. If you have a recipe for a blonde ale, we are going to see if we can make it happen. So there's really nothing um, that isn't tried and true throughout it. And then on top of that, just the gamut of beers that we make. I mean, we make this amazing, you know, pilsners and clean, light, modern beers all the way to a really complex traditional tertiary fermented in, um, in like spirits barrels and then blended with fruit, 
pull fruit. So there's really nothing in our portfolio, I feel like, that doesn't fit a beer drinker or even a non-beer drinker. And I love that. I think it it's really fun to be able to work with such a wide um, array of products. That's and awesome. That, <laughs> um, that kind of leads me to um, something that happened, something that's happening cool at the, at the brewery tonight. You mentioned that, um, you know, there's this wide portfolio, be, portfolio of beers at Crooked Stave. And we had talked, you and I had talked about um, having the founder chat on or maybe having the production manager on, but they're doing something very cool at the brewery right now. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So um, in situations like this, I always love having Chad or a production manager on because, um, you know, it's really nice to hear from the people hands on the ground who are really developing these beers and then putting them into production. Uh, however, tonight we are doing one of our spawn brews. Um, so 100% method traditional, uh, spontaneously fermented golden sour. So that is going into our cool ship. We have brewed our wort. It's sitting in our cool ship overnight. Um, we can only do this as temperatures are at a certain time. Our temperatures have dropped for um, Denver, Colorado overnight. And so we have one of our cool ship spawn brews happening. The team really loves being involved in that. And so um, they wanted to definitely be hands on past eight o'clock for Denver time. And so they passed the torch off to me to kind of be here to talk to you guys, but super exciting. Um, the last three years in a row, we've won a silver or a gold medal at JBF, um, for these spawn brews. So we're very like proud of them, but they are 100% a very hands-on process and, um, something that our team loves doing and does together. So if you're in production, you're pretty much at the brewery right now working on the spawn. Uh, well, that leads us perfectly into our second beer. Um, I would like to attest to the, to the spontaneous beers. It's my, that's my absolute favorite style of beer is, you know, traditional Lambic, traditional goose. And I visited the tap room, uh, Denver on a couple occasions and, uh, God, you all make such great sour beer, which leads us into, uh, Kaylee, what would you like to tell us about this Excelsior chai sour ale? Yeah. So I am amped about this beer. Um, I will say I would have been drinking an Excelsior chai as opposed to a Cricket Save New Zealand pills right now, because it is like the perfect cold weather, like bundle up, but just the right amount of sour beer. Um, so an 8% ABV, it's unapologetically tart. Um, unlike a lot of the things that we put into cans, this is kind of our gratitude for tradition and relationships. So we have a great relationship with Schilling Cider. It's our collab um, with Schilling. We took our burgundy base, so essentially 100% primary fermented um, kind of a red base that we had in our fooders for six to eight months, and we added Excelsior, uh, Excelsior apples that Schilling had sent us. So essentially the Schilling, the same ones that they use in their Excelsior cider, we use that apple base. This was a super fun collab for us in the sense that it brings, it brought together not only, like I said, the relationship with like other brewery cideries, people who are going unique, but also our love for science. So we actually started this collab two years ago. And over the course of about nine months, we could not get the beer to ferment. So we went back and forth, um, added additional app cider from the Excelsior. We were working on whether the Britam Britannomyces within the actual fooder during primary fermentation was not fermenting due to the sugar content that came from the 
apples. There was so much back and forth um, to the point where we were sending lab samples to Schilling. Schilling was sending lab samples to us. We were loving this process because our favorite thing about brewing, specifically our sours, is that we're able to really dive into the complexity of it. Why certain things work, what our Brett is doing, why flavors are coming out. Um, so long story short, we were able to get this beer to ferment. And then what we did was halfway through, we added the chai, the chai concentrate that comes from their chider base that they had also sent us um, to this. So we have about a two year <laughs> tertiary fermented um, sour in a can that uses the Excelsior apples along with the chai base from Schilling. I think it definitely is on the more sour side than some of our like say petite series or sour rosé. However, for like this weather, along with the warmness from the 8% ABV, it really balances out. It is by far my favorite beer to drink right now. My husband just took the last can before I was able to drink it. <laughs> I, uh, I feel very bad for you. Um, I like to say that this show is uh, PG-13. Um, so I'm going to use our one F-bomb here. This is a fucking great beer. Like, holy crap. <laughs> it is really fantastic. And it, I am in Missouri where we're getting ready to get some snow tonight. And it's like, just like you said, just like perfect. Like get some like apple pie bites in there a little bit. Yeah. I love the tartness. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And the complexity has definitely changed over time. I have noticed in the chat, like these are the beers that we definitely get excited about. We love our IPAs, we love some other things, but it's super fun to be able to see something from the start, from the visualization of it with another, you know, beverage brand to then like work through the kinks to like figure out how we can make it better. And then when it finally came out, it was like our whole team was so excited about the turnout the seasonality of it, um, along with just really seeing the burgundy base shine. Um, a lot of our bases, yeah, more like method traditional spawn. They're all amazing. They're all still 100% fermented in oak. So, um, but it's really fun to just do something slightly different than our regular rotating sour series. And this is honestly like my favorite winter warmer that we have. Love it. Uh, somebody is asking in the chat, is Schilling a cidery local to CS? I guess they mean Colorado Springs. I believe they're in Washington, right? They're out of Washington. We do distribute them in Colorado. Um, and so Cricket Save owns their own distribution company here in Colorado, and they are one of our partners. So I think that they're pretty much nationwide but also very true to tradition, like using um, whole fruits in a lot of their apple production and items like that. So um, they're amazing and they do a really good job. We're excited to partner with anyone who ha has those same values as us, so. Yeah, very cool. Um, so we asked our guests last week this question, but we'd love to hear from you what you think. Um, Colorado seems to have, you know, a real appreciation for sour beer. Um, obviously, Crooked Stave um, nails it with the sour beer, um, especially the um, traditional styles like we've talked about with like the wild yeast, the spontaneous fermentation. So where do you think that appreciation comes from in Colorado specifically? Yeah. I mean, to call it out, Chad will always say that um, New Belgium, honestly, was one of the first that like put out those bottles here in Colorado and people really started to kind of latch on to it. So I'll, I'll give credit where credit's due. I think New, Belg New Belgium and um, their sour series, their food or forest, all of that has definitely helped within Colorado. I think Crooked Stave has definitely played a part in um, in that traditional sour and kind of upping it to the next level of 
we were a primarily only wild and sour brewery up until 2017. Um, 2016, kind of Von Pilsner was the first one that we came out with as a clean beer. We partnered with another only sour brewery and we were like, we like Pilsners too, um, <laughs> and kind of put out that. So I think that Colorado drinkers in general as well, they're very into experimenting. They they are educated in the sense of like the difference between a lot of kettle sours and um, traditional sours, but each of those sours play their part, right? Like, I think that everyone has the part in the game, um, regardless of where they are. But I do really think that, yeah, New Belgium, I will say from our brewery in particular, Chad and even our production manager, Danny, say that they remember being in college, like going and buying their first La Folie bottle and like saving up their money and tasting it and not being like anything they've ever had. Um, I think the, a lot of breweries that do traditional sours within Colorado really uphold tradition of how they're supposed to be made. And then also have a nice balance of using whole fruit, um, and the processes that it takes to get through. So I think, I mean, our state in general has some amazing traditional sours and kettle sours. So hopefully that process continues and people continue to buy them. I think that it will forever be the art, um, of making beer and it, it truly is a passion project and a labor of love. The amount of times that we touch our sour beers, the amount of times that, um, we are felt or transferring them, tasting them, uh, blending them. It is, it is truly like a passion project and it makes making them so much more fun. So yeah, totally. The passion definitely shows. And I think um, that's probably why people love drinking them so much. I um, lived in Fort Collins for just a minute when I was in college and um, got to go see the food or forest, you know, and I was like 21 years old. Um, and I think that it had a lot to do with my trajectory into being an enormous like beer nerd, like being in Colorado when I was that young um, and being around people that were super passionate and not just like cranking beer out for volume and, you know, to, to, to be cool, to work at a brewery or, um, you know, whatever reason people brew, but um, yeah, that's so nice to hear. I definitely think your passion shows and the appreciation shows up in the, in the culture of the beer drinking there. Thanks. And fun fact, we almost rival New Belgium's fooder forest. Um, <laughs> in regards to fooders, I believe we have one additional than them. However, they beat us in spirits and wood barrels. So Ooh. Um, yeah, it is really fun because um, I always go and visit. And then uh, when we came back the year, we got our two additional like sherry and cognac barrels um, or fooders. Uh, Chad mentioned that we were one ahead and I was pretty excited about it. Very nice. I had never been to Crooked Stable. I'll have to, I'll have to come check it out soon. You should. And everyone listening is always yeah. welcome to come to our tap room. So everyone should absolutely do it. I'm sorry. I have just been terrible, terrible host. I, sp I spilled my beer all over my computer oh, Brian. Right, right when you were giving that excellent, passionate answer to that question. <laughs> it's all over my desk. It got on my film camera so my, and i'm most disappointed because this is like one of my favorite beers we've ever had on first slash yeah. um, too excited about those beers i'm too excited i i went to type something and like swung my big dumb stupid hand and and <laughs> just blasted that glass right into my computer but anyways uh kaylee we're in the first month of 2023 here um what are the biggest challenges as you see them facing Crooked Stave in 2023? I think, I mean, anyone who has been in beer for the last two years has just kind of noticed the ebbs and flows with COVID, lockdown, on premise shutting down. Last year, inflation. <laughs> Our uh, raw material costs, shipping. Um, I think as long as we can kind of pass those hurdles and continue to be innovative, 
but those are big hurdles that I think everyone's going to have to face in 2023. Um, Hyper local is something that we're looking at within, we are in other states and um, a lot of other states with the pandemic have gone back to kind of some hyper locality within their beer buying. And it makes sense. I mean, as a consumer of beer, I do tend to buy beer that was made closer to home when I'm out. Um, I love trying new ones, but at the same time, I think it is just something that we have recognized. So um, yeah, between inflation of raw materials and some hyper local buying, I think those are definitely um, issues or challenges that everyone's going to be facing as a brewery here um, in 2023. But we have some really fun stuff coming out that we're excited about. So speaking of which, what are you the most excited about for the brewery in 2023? Oh my God. I love this question because, um, I love that you guys started with the new Belgium fat tire <laughs> whole thing, because it was something we had been talking about at our brewery, even today and last week when they announced it and all this crazy stuff. But, um, you know, as a team last year, we sit down and we work with like our whole team on a whole product development. So we have planned out our year. We try to use, um, so mostly we only use fruit that's either grown in Colorado or in Washington where our other owner Yetta was from. Um, so raspberries, blueberries, cherries, peaches from Colorado, um, and then sometimes apricots, green Bartlett pears. So um, we're really excited about this year's crop because the last two years, the crop has been completely diminished. We haven't had any cherries or apricots. Um, the peach crop was almost completely wiped out. So we're excited for this year coming for fruit, but we're also excited to bring back some nostalgic styles, essentially. Um, our team, our brewers, our cellarmen, you know, we we talked a lot about some nostalgia from Crooked Save in general. We are going to be revamping our Surrette and VA um, lines, and we're going to be putting them in 16-ounce cans. So Surrette is going to have a new name, Garden Beer. So a traditional Saison, mm -hmm. Oak Age, and four-pack 16-ounce cans. Um, VA also getting a little release, hopefully towards like the July months, we are then working on some clean beers and bringing back like a hoppy amber style, similar to fat tire. I don't believe that it's going to be like the end all be all or ever like a fat tire, but we as a team have just decided, you know, beer has swung in such a big spectrum, you know, to like the smoothie IPAs and these like crazy things that all of us are looking to kind of bring back when we started drinking beer and what that involved. And we're actually really excited about it. So it's only going to be super small releases. They will see some of the other seats, um, but really small batches on the 16 ounce can just mostly like what our team wants to drink, um, like a wit beer, a Belgian blonde. Um, some of those fun things. And then also kind of a revamp, hopefully, of our Wild Wild Bread series. So like what Chad dove into um, when he was adding fruit to some of these and like, how can we revamp these styles and make them our own again and um, bring those back? So we definitely have the gamut of like clean beers, traditional, some things that you haven't seen in a long time, and then some crazy um, nostalgia from the past, like we might bring back a Colorado wild sage brew, um, some crazy things that we haven't done in a while. So I think for us, 2023 is like the year of nostalgia. And it seems like it is similar to a lot of people recently in a lot of breweries who are bringing back, um, nostalgic can labels and things like that. Um, but kind of reminding people why they got into beer, why they love it. So Wow. That's yeah. Awesome. We'll have to keep our eyes peeled. Surrette and um, VA are like why I started drinking Crooked today. Just some of my absolute favorites. I'll have to keep my eye out for that. Mine too. So I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was a hard push <laughs> for the return of Surrette. I was like, it's so good. Please. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about that beer before you came on. I was like, what happened to that beer? Like I haven't had that in so long. I need to find one of those. So I'm excited. 
Um, I had one more question, but I do want to get somebody on uh, in the chat had a really good question. Can you talk briefly about the can art? Do you have a go to person, uh, especially with these two cans that like, I mean, it's a giraffe. It's a it's a space giraffe, an astronaut giraffe, yeah. and just this beautiful, comfortable looking uh, New Zealand Pilsner logo. Can you talk about the can art for a minute here? Of course. Yeah. We have an amazing graphic designer. Her name is Sierra. Um, she does every single one of our label designs. I will say, for example, the giraffe, the Excelsior Chai, it is floating in space in a fooder. Um, it's a little eccentric. Whenever we do a collab, we really want our collab to collab in the art department as well. So um, this is like a partial rendition of ours and a partial rendition of Schilling. So Schilling sent us like an initial thoughts on our label and then we kind of add our own brand spin. If you've ever had any of our collapse in the past, that is almost always how we did it. We, um, yeah, we've done some really fun ones where we try to blend their art with ours. Um, the, so the giraffe is the Excelsior chai, um, or sorry, the Excelsior cider logo. If you've ever picked up a shilling Excelsior cider, they have a giraffe. They always have animals. Um, so then the Excelsior chai, we put them in outer space and then the fooder is like our oak age version. So it's kind of, it's definitely unique, but it is a blend of both of us. Um, the other ones that we have, Sierra is amazing. She's constantly innovating and changing our labels and, um, we love her for that. It, it definitely changes up from brand consistency more often, but she's always looking at the new latest trends. Um, our sour lines tend to have like very similar flows, New Zealand Pilsner in general. She definitely has a little bit more of like the trendy wallpaper art. Um, that she goes towards. And then a lot of our core brands have more um, of the, I would say, like landscapey vibes to them. A lot of that has to do with those are the ones that we consume on a more frequent basis. And then being in Colorado, part of the reasons why we switched, we used to be bottle only in 20 up until 2017. And when we switched into cans, we were the first brewery to put a traditional sour in a can and also the first brewery to put a Brett beer in a can. Um, we worked really in depth with ball on the can liner in regards to that because Brett beers and sour beers evolve within the can, whereas um, so their acidity could get more over time. Um, so with all of those, like we chose to put it in a can because we wanted to take these beers outside. We wanted to take them on adventures. We wanted to explore the outdoors with them. And we didn't think that you had to sacrifice quality on your beer or what you wanted to drink just because you were going on a hut trip or you were taking it on a 14er or up to the top of a peak. Um, so I think a lot of our art in regards to our cores and then even some of our sours and our seasonality just has to do with where we enjoy to drink them. Awesome. Um, Kaylee, what is something that you wish for Collins, Denver, Colorado in general was more well known for? Yeah, I think we definitely get the gamut on most amount of breweries, but I also think um, the places that you can enjoy it, <laughs> not the most amount, but most people come to Colorado if they're in the beer scene and they're like, you have a ton of breweries. Um, most amount of consistently good breweries, I will say for any state I've been to. I, yeah, that's, yeah. that's exciting. I've also yeah. been to a lot of states and I was like, oh, there's some people out there who are going to get mad at me for that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Population to brewery percentage. There's like statistics. Um, I, to be perfectly honest, I think that Colorado is just beautiful all time, all year round. Um, so a lot of people think that they have to visit like during specific seasons or whatnot, but there is something fun to do in Colorado all the time. Um, Fort Collins in general has 
gorgeous outdoor spaces. They have a ton of breweries, but they also have a lot of live music. Um, they have farmers markets. They have an in-depth sense of community. Um, and it doesn't matter when you're around, like a lot of people think it's just a college town and it's not. Um, but Denver, Fort Collins, you come up to the mountains, like it doesn't matter the time of the year. There are some amazing activities to be had between like whitewater rafting or mountain biking or skiing or like you name it. We pretty much have it. And our weather is top notch. I was literally joking with my husband the other day. I was like, it has snowed every single day this year, I feel like, and I need some sunshine back in my life. We have 300 days of sunshine normally and it's gorgeous and it might snow and then it's sunny, but, um, there's almost always something fun that you can find to do. And I know a lot of people come out to adventure, but it does not matter what you want to do, whether it's city life or like get just right outside of the city and explore. There's something for everyone. So come visit, drink some good beer and, uh, yeah, we'd love to have you. Wow. What a great endorsement. I think you sold us. Yeah, really. <laughs> side your side gigs with the Colorado Tourism Board. Yeah, it should be. <laughs> They'll be calling me up after this, hopefully. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us, Kaylee. Anything to plug before we get out of here? Mainly, where can people find Crooked Stave beer? Yeah. So we are all across the nation from California up to Maine. Um, I do know that we got asked about Connecticut. We're not quite there yet. Pennsylvania. Um, we are in Pennsylvania and like down the Eastern seaboard. Uh, yeah. Virginia, North Carolina, Maine, Vermont. Um, yeah, you can find us a lot of places where we're no longer in Georgia, but we were, but you can find us in Florida, a close neighbor. Um, <laughs> there is also a lovely, you know, other companies that do some direct to consumer, some, some total wine that you can, you can find us in. And then if you're ever international, we're, we're in a lot of places over there. So from Japan, Sweden, um, China to, oh gosh, the UK, Ireland, France. Um, so definitely check out Crooked Stave. We're all across the board. Um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to email us at our cheers at Crooked Stave account. I say that my one joy in life is trying to get beer to people who cannot get it. Um, so I'd love to help you find more Crooked Stave and uh, get more Crooked Stave at your house. So feel free to let me know. Yeah, well, I did just, you know, just want to say I, I did spill half of my Excelsior earlier. So, you know, I, I think if you could send me a half a can. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we got you. <laughs> um, no, I very much look forward to the next time that I get to go out to Colorado. I think C CBC is bound to be there one of these upcoming years. So I, I'll be out there for that at least. But I got to find a... a I gotta, I gotta get myself out there when I'm not doing work-related things and just enjoy Colorado because uh, it makes it makes a good case for best state in in these United States, um, and many of those reasons is the wonderful beer scene, um, and uh, one of those great breweries is Crooked State, and uh, just thanks again to Crooked State for supplying beers for the show and for our beer club. Uh, as always, you could head over to Bruvana.com and check out subscription options for the beer club. Get excellent beers like these sent to you every month. We'll be back next week with our final episode, Tears, Sadness, uh, our final episode uh, on the Colorado, Fort Collins, Northern Colorado area. Um, but until then, stay safe, be kind, and support local breweries, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for watching Brews Less Traveled on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel for more interviews with brewery professionals.